Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Wow, what a big house. Anyway, <laughs> you know, this is kind of, I'm just going to use this real quick, and I'm going to get off of it. The most amazing thing that has happened on this cruise that I have ever experienced, there are five other people from my hometown. <laughs> Little teeny Binghamton, New York. Thanks, sis. No. And none of them are related to me. That's amazing. We ought to get together out in baristas after the talk or something. I don't know. Anyway, I'd like to welcome you to this talk on Zanzibar. And I'm going to say Tanzania. Some people say it's Tanzania. I guess if you're from the UK or New Zealand, it might be Tanzania. But I say Tanzania. Anyway, whatever it is, that's where we're going to talk about. My name, as you know, is still Don Campbell. And I'm very happy to still be with you as your enrichment lecturer. I've got a few more to go, so this one is kind of interesting because we're getting into the wonderful continent of Africa. Now, the last big O question was, what did Robert Fulton really call his first steamboat? His experiment or his steamboat? That was all. Anyway, we're going to have another chance for you to win big O points, and today it's going to be three. So I'm getting more generous in my old age. Let's sail on to Zanzibar. Now, Zanzibar's original name is uh, Yugunda, Yugunja, which uh, was a Swahili name, and uh, it was basically used back in antiquity. And the historic center of this place is a little place called Stone Town. We're going to look at all of that stuff as we go along. Zanzibar is really a, a palm-fringed archipelago of about, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 islands, maybe a few small drying rocks. Sits about 20 miles off the coast of Tanzania. Uh, the main island is separated from the mainland by the what some people call the Tanzania Channel, other people call the Zanzibar Channel. So I guess it decides which guide you've got for your tour. Anyway, at the narrowest point, this island is only about 36 kilometers or maybe 23 miles wide. For oh, at least 20,000 years, Zanzibar has had people that have come here, gone away, come back. But the first permanent human residents were residents of a group of people called the Bantu who began arriving from the mainland only about 1000 AD. Now in Zanzibar they lived in small kind of independent villages and they didn't merge with any of the other people or anybody else on the island. And because they had a pretty loose organization, no real central power or anything, they were really easily dominated by outsiders who came along later. Persian traders used Zanzibar as a base for voyages between the Middle East, uh, India, and Africa. It was kind of a little trading post. The island offered a protective and uh, sa defensible harbor, and what was to become Zanzibar City was a convenient point from which they could trade with the Swahili coastal towns. Now, the Persians established some garrisons on the island, and they kind of had a little bit of a permanent mem uh, presence here for a while. And he also built the first Zoroastrian fire temples. Uh, back in India, remember I talked about the Zoroastrians. Anyway, the, they built the first of those temples here. And they also built the first mosques in the southern hemisphere in Zanzibar. Now, during the Middle Ages, Zanzibar was really pretty advanced. The Bantu Swahili people served as intermediaries. And they worked between the local people, the Arabs, the Persians, the Indonesians, Malaysians, Indians, and even Chinese merchants. So they were kind of, uh, I guess you'd call alms budsmen for everybody. The interaction contributed in part to an evolution of the Swahili culture. The Bantu language that's used today is known as Swahili, and it has features that really came from many other civilizations, but most of it is from Arabic. Vasco da Gama's first visit was in 1498, and that marked the beginning of European influence in Zanzibar. That became part of the Portuguese Empire when a captain named Rui Marquez landed here. Uh, he demanded and received tribute from the local sultan in exchange for peace. You know, if you don't give me the stuff, I'm going to shell your city. That was kind of the Portuguese thing at the time. Now, when the Portuguese arrived, they found a series of independent little towns. And those villages were primarily populated by Arabs. But none of those towns were linked to Arabia, Arabia by any strong political tie. The Portuguese had some pretty hostile relationships with the Arabs. And by the 16th century, uh, they had actually overcome that resistance and established their power here. Uh, Zanzibar was still pretty troublesome for them, though, because 
that was a launching point for rebellions that were happening up in Mombasa, up on the coast of Kenya, and those rebellions were against the Portuguese rule. Now, Zanzibar remained a possession of Portugal for almost two centuries, and the first English ship really arrived here back in 1591. And all that was there, uh, happened was this was just a trade depot. That's all the Portuguese really ever set up here. And that's where por uh, produce was purchased and collected for shipment on to Mozambique and to other places. Portugal ultimately built the fortress 45 years later. And that was in response to the Sultan in Mombasa who slaughtered a bunch of Portuguese or many Portuguese residents several years earlier. So all of this is still tied with that earlier colonial effort by the Portuguese. Portugal, on their side, they appointed several European governors, people from back home that they wanted to, I guess, send on a, an exotic adventure. But the local natives hated them. And they, in turn, the natives, in turn, turned to Oman and asked for assistance to drive the foreigners, the Portuguese, out of their country. In 1832, Said bin Sultan moved his capital from Muscat, Oman. You remember that place. We were up there. It had nice soup, good shopping. Anyway, the sultan moved down here, and he established his presence on Stone Town in Zanzibar. Now, when he died, Said's will divided all of his territory, the stuff way up north plus the stuff here, into two separate principalities. One son became the sultan of Oman, and the other the first sultan of Zanzibar. Now, the brothers quarreled over that will, but just the way everything happens, they turned to outside powers to have it adjudicated, and the Viceroy of Great Britain and the Governor General from India both said, that will sounds good to us, so that's the way it's going to stand. Now, the Persian baths that are nearby Kadichi were built by Sultan Said. He owned land in that part of the island, and he and his second wife often came here just to go hunting or to oversee the work that was being done on their plantations. Now, the bathhouse was constructed so that they could refresh after the long, arduous travel from town. It's not that far, as you'll see when, if you go out there. Now, the baths were built following a Persian architectural style, and that's because the wife was the granddaughter of the Shah of what is now Iran. They had an underground furnace that kept the water warm. Speaking of warm, I don't know why they had to heat the water. You're going to find out tomorrow. It's plenty warm. Now, the water might have felt chilly because the air will be very warm and very humid. Now, the surrounding plantations originally belong, uh, surrounding the Said plantation belonged to an Arab trader who imported the first clove plants to Zanzibar. Now, Said confiscated them because that Arab was a slave trader. You're going to learn later that that was kind of the pot calling the kettle black. Malindi on Zanzibar was the Swahili coast main port for slave trade with the Middle East. And most people don't realize that all the slaves didn't go to the colonies in, in the Americas. A lot of them went to the Middle East, to China, to Japan, and, and to Southeast Asia. During his 14-year reign as sultan, Said consolidated his power around that huge slave industry. And as many as 50,000 of the slaves passed through his port every year. Now, many slaves were captured by Arab Tipu Tip, Tipu Tib. Say that real fast about eight times. Anyway, he was a notorious slaver and ivory trader who basically got the name Tipu Tib because of the sounds of the guns that he used. He had multiple guns, and when he fired them, the natives thought that was the sound. He led expeditions, some with as many as 40 or 4,000 people, into the African interior. When he got there, the local chiefs would sell him slaves for basically next to nothing. They just wanted to get their enemies away from their villages. He also bought a lot of ivory in Central Africa for the, from the suppliers who sold it to him for a very low price. Tib then used all the slaves that he bought to carry the ivory back to Zanzibar. And once he got to Zanzibar, he sold both the slaves and the ivory at the local markets for very large profit. Now, in time, Tib became one of the wealthiest men in all of Zanzibar. He owned multiple plantations and at one time had as many as 10,000 slaves. This is his portrait that's in the House of uh, Wonders Museum in Stonetown, and I know some people are going to be going there. Now, Tipu Tib had an interesting background. His mother was a Muscat Arab, 
She was born in the ruling class, and his father and paternal grandfather were coastal Swahili natives. He met and helped several famous Western explorers on the African continent itself, and one of them was a man named Henry Morton Stanley. In 1841, Stanley was born in Wales under the name of John Rowlands. His parents were unmarried, and his birth certificate describes him as a bastard. Hey, that was common at the time. The stigma of, that, stigma of that illegitimacy actually weighed heavily on him for his entire life. Now, he was sent to a workhouse for the poor when he was very young, and the overcrowding and lack of supervision resulted in very frequent abuse by the older boys and even some of the uh, adults that were at the workhouse. At the age of 18, Rowland sailed for the United States in search for a new life. He disembarked in New Orleans and became friendly with a wealthy local merchant named Henry Hope Stanley. He saw Stanley sitting on the chair in front of his store and asked the man if he had any jobs available. Well, as it happened, the man was childless and had indeed been wishing that he had a son of his own. He gave the lad a job, and, and also that led to a very close relationship between the two of them. John Rowlands actually took up Stanley's name and became Henry Morton Stanley. Young Stanley assumed that name, and he also took on the local accent so that he would talk like somebody from New Orleans, and pretty soon denied that he had come from any place other than that city. Stanley participated reluctantly in the American Civil War. First, he joined the Confederate Army. He was taken captive went to a prison camp, and then changed over and became a member of the Union Army. That was kind of boring, so then he joined the Union Navy, and he was just in search for greater adventure. Now, I have to tell you, he may be the only man in history that served in the Confederate Army, the Union Army, and the Union Navy during the Civil War. Now, following the Civil War, Henry Morton Stanley began a career as a journalist. Uh, he organized an expedition, well, among others, to go to the Ottoman Empire. Now, that was a catastrophe because he ended up being arrested and thrown into prison. He was a pretty glib talker, so eventually he was able to get out of jail and even received compensation for the damage from his equipment that had happened during his arrest. Pretty soon, Stanley was hired or retained by a man named James Gordon Bennett, who was the founder of the New York Herald newspaper. In 1869, Stanley was instructed by Bennett's son to go find the Scottish missionary and explorer David Livingston. Now I'm going to just digress a little bit and tell you a little bit about Livingston. Now David Livingston was a late 19th century Victorian British citizen. Uh, he had a real rags to riches but near mythic status. He was a Protestant missionary. Some thought of him as a martyr. He had a working class background. He was a scientific investigator and an explorer, imperial reformer, anti-slavery crusader, and an advocate of commercial empire. Kind of somewhat dichotomy there. He began exploring in Africa in the mid-19th century. Now, actually, he started pretty early on, and I'm only going to talk about the last time that he was there searching for the source of the Nile River. Now, this is the house that's in the southern part of Tanzania, where, the Livingston, where Livingston began his last expedition. In 1866, he had returned to Africa, starting off in Zanzibar, and he wanted to find the source of the Nile River. He assembled a team of freed slaves, people called islanders, and two servants from a previous expedition. Now, he didn't think he was lost, but he was completely out of contact with the outside world for the next six years. I mean, we thought the explorers that went across the Pacific on those little ships early on that didn't have radios, they were out of contact. This, they were only gone for three years. This guy was gone for six years, so no wonder they thought he was lost. Anyway, here's what happened. Livingston's assistants, all those people that he had with him uh, as porters and so on, gradually deserted him. They stole what medicine and supplies they could, and the Islander people returned to Zanzibar and told the authorities there that Livingston was dead. The year 19, or 1869 began as he became extremely ill. Of course, he wasn't dead. He was just sick. He, he was saved by an Arab slave trader and his column 
who gave him medicine and took him to one of his outposts. So there's a little bit of a conflict for Livingston. He's being saved by slave traders that he's violently opposed to. Then he came down with things, you know, little minor diseases, malaria, cholera, and even had tropical ulcers on his feet. He was again forced to turn to the slave traders, but as he was with them, he witnessed the slaughter of 400 Africans who were be being killed by those slavers. That horrified him and basically left him so shattered that he couldn't continue with his mission to find the source of the Nile. In the meantime, our friend Stanley had traveled to Zanzibar and he outfitted an expedition with absolutely the best of everything. Old James Bennett back in the States at the Herald had given him basically an open checkbook and said, buy what you need. So he did. Uh, there was so much, about eight and a half tons of material that it took 200 porters just to carry it. Now his 700 mile expedition through the tropical jungles became a nightmare right away. Uh, he had a thoroughbred stallion that had been given to him and it died within a few days of the trip beginning after it was bitten by a tsetse fly and then got parasitic worms. Many of Stanley's porters did the same thing that Livingston's people did. They deserted and the rest of them were decimated by tropical diseases. Now Stanley is reported to have found Livingston in about 1871. So this is quite a while after Livingston had disappeared into the jungle. Now he may have greeted him with the now famous Dr. Livingston, I presume. Well, there's really no proof that that phrase actually happened and it may have been a fabrication. The Stanley's diary, which documented everything that he did during this whole trip, the pages that were there from the time he first met Livingston were mysteriously torn from his journal. Even Livingston's written account of the meeting fails to mention those words. Now one biographer actually argued that Stanley invented it because of the fact that he was insecure about his own background and the fact someone might discover that he was in fact not American. Anyway, Henry became Sir Henry Morgan Stanley when he was made a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath in 1899. That was in recognition of his service to the British Empire in Africa. Now one of the things that I'm not going to talk too much about, but Stanley went back to Africa and did a lot of exploration including one walk across Africa to find the source of the Congo River and he became a very eminent explorer in his own right. But we're not quite finished with Stanley yet. Uh, we need him to segue back to our good friend Tipu Tip. You remember him, he was that wealthy slave trader back in Zanzibar. Now in early 1887, Stanley arrived back in Zanzibar and proposed that Tipu Tip be made the governor of Stanley Falls District, named of course after Henry Morton Stanley, in the Congo Free State. Tip's autobiography of that era was the first book written in the Bantu language, the Swahili language. Now later, Tipu Tip died of malaria at his home in Stonetown. Now, we'll go keep jumping around here. You need a little bit of a program to tell the players, but anyway, now we're going to talk a little more about the Sultan bin Said family. Now at about that time, they helped abolish slave trade. This was a guy who th really made a fortune on slaves. Now he's going to abolish the trade in the Zanzibar archipelago, and he also started to make great improvements to the island's infrastructure. The Sultan built the Marubi Palace in 1882. That was for his wife and oh, a hundred concubines. The Sultan didn't live there though. He lived in a separate palace down in town. Ah, could you blame him? <laughs> Would I want to live with a hundred and one women? Oh man, the demands had to be really great. Anyway, within ten years the Marubi Palace was destroyed by a fire and it left only a few of the remains that can be seen today. And you can also see the old Persian style bathhouse, the original water reservoirs, and some very large mango trees that were originally imported from India. The Sultan's palace itself, this is the one down in the town, was built in 1883 in the Omani style, and it's a pretty extravagant Arab style or type mansion. It was pretty opulent with beautiful marble floors, coral stone walls, and silver decorations. Some of the inner doors of the palace were decorated and carved with inscriptions from the Koran. The marble floors and most of the silver decorations all came from Europe. 
And today it, it's a museum that holds a lot of the relics uh, that offer a very rare glimpse into that era, particularly that era in this part of the world. Now the Sultan allegedly, there, there's things outside that you can see where this may have happened, but it's just allegedly because there's no document of it, had wild animals that were chained up side, outside for display. Those were right in front of the building. You know, a lion here, a tiger there, a zebra here, whatever. Anyway, he also had the main door of the palace made wide enough so he could enter the building while riding on an elephant. No small thing. Now, the town itself and the palace are historical buildings, and they're on the, the uh, UNESCO World Heritage List. Now back to our story. Anyway, in the mid-19th century, Germany and, and Great Britain were plotting to get parts of Zanzibar Sultanate for their own empires. Remember, this was still during the time of co colonialization and all that. And control of the country eventually came into the hands of the British Empire. Ships from the Royal Navy were used to enforce, enforce a new ban on slavery, and they captured dows that were carrying slaves all the time. But with only four ships patrolling the whole area around Zanzibar, that Navy found it very hard to enforce the ban. And who were the ships that were carrying the, ship, the slaves away from this area? France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, and even the United States because slavery had not yet been abolished in their countries. But in 1896, Sultan Khalid, who was one of the Said families, uh, took control of Zanzibar. But Great Britain didn't approve. They thought this was not the right guy. They didn't want him. And that led to a thing called the Anglo-Zanzibar War. Now, when the British attacked, the Sultan and 40 of his closest followers sought refuge by running into the German consulate. There they were guarded by armed German sailors while the English stood outside uh, with their Marines holding their rifles waiting to arrest him. But the German consul refused to surrender Khalid to the British. In making his escape, the Sultan stepped from the embassy grounds directly onto a German warship and therefore was able to escape. Now the Royal Navy wasn't really happy about all of this, so they bombarded the city, severely damaging a lot of stuff. But a ceasefire was called 38 minutes later. But because of the bombardment, thousands of Arabs and Indians had already been killed and thousands more were uh, ultimately sent away from the country. To this day, that bombardment of Zanzibar stands as the shortest war in recorded history. God, don't we wish all of our wars could last for just 38 minutes? Think of how good that would be in the old budget. But that little short war was not without its consequences. The Royal Navy destroyed part of the palace, it was subsequently rebuilt, badly damaged the complex that saw its harem and the lighthouse demolished. A month after the Zanzibar Revolution, the Sultan's Palace was formally renamed the People's Palace and it was converted to use as a government seat. Of course, they fixed it up a little bit. In the nearby House of Wonder, Wonders was mostly undamaged during the Anglo-Zanzibar War and that became the main office for the British authorities. We're going to knock everything else down, and whatever's left standing, we're going to occupy. Now, the House of Wonders was once the most modern building in East Africa, thus its name. It was the first building in East Africa to have electricity and an elevator. It mixes elements of European-style construction with Zanzibari traditions. It has cast iron columns, elaborate door carvings, open courtyard in the center, and mangrove wood ceilings. And if you look at it closely when you're there, you can see this, call, it's called coral rag. What it is, it's coral stone. It's kind of bubbly limestone walls that came from ancient coral. Now today the House of Coral has uh, is a museum and it has exhibitions that are dedicated to Swahili culture and the Palace Museum, not too far away, highlights the ties to the, the Zanzibar's Omani history. Now, I got a little warning for you. The buildings aren't the best maintained in the world. They're in pretty poor condition. In fact, in 2012, a corner of this building, a large corner of the House of Wonders, collapsed. So if you go, you might want to take a hard hat. <laughs> now, there's a large metepi, and it's a main attraction in the House of Wonders Museum. Now, Mtepi is a sewn ship that's associated with the Swahili people. Mtepi's planks were actually held together by wooden pegs 
tied with coconut fiber. Now you can also see things like uh, ceremony of kangas in the museum. Now a kanga is a rectangle of pure cotton cloth, has a border all around it, and it's printed in bold designs and has bright colors. It's called a kanga after a very noisy, sociable little bird called a guinea fowl that has really elegant spotty uh, plumage. Now the material is pretty much as long as you can outstretch your arms and wide enough to cover you from your neck to your knees or from your chest to your toes, depending on how modest you are. Congas originated on the coast of East Africa at the turn of the 19th century. And as the story goes, some stylish ladies from Zanzibar got the idea of buying printed kerchiefs. They bought different kinds and they would sew them together to form very individual designs. The new design was called lesso after the kerchief squares that were originally brought to Africa by Portuguese traders. Conga designs evolved over the years from simple spots and borders, and today there's a wide variety of all kinds of elegant patterns and every conceivable motif and color. And this is one of these big souvenirs that you could probably buy while you're in Zanzibar. Now for a century, congas were designed and printed just in India, the Far East, and in Europe. But since about 1950, 52, something like that, more and more congas were being designed and printed in Tanzania, Kenya, and other countries in Africa. By the turn of the century, Swahili sayings were added to the kangas. Supposedly, it was started by a trader in Mombasa who was known as Abdullah, probably one of the three or 4,000 Abdullahs in Mombasa, whose many kangas often offered a proverb. And one of them, this one in particular, says, and I don't understand what this proverb means, it's strange for a dry coconut to want to break a stone. Now, if you have a little insight as to what that really means, meet me out in Barista after the talk and let me know. It's kind of a puzzle to me. Anyway, there are also very noticeable regional differences in these particular pieces of fabric. For example, most of the congas with mottos like this one come from Kenya, and the ones that have contemporary social or political events that are tied to them are more common in Tanzania. Now let's go back a little bit to the history of Zanzibar, to our good friend Sultan Khalid. Now he was ultimately captured by the British, but that didn't happen until 1916 during the East African campaign in World War I. He was ultimately exiled to the Seychelles. You remember that was just a couple days ago, before being allowed to return finally to East Africa, and he died in Mombasa in 1927. Now the bloody Zanzibar revolution led to the establishment of the People's Republic in Zanzibar, kind of a socialist experiment, if you will. In turn, it merged with mainland Tanzania and was renamed the United Republic of Tanzania. Now, Zanzibar, re Zanzibar remained semi-autonomous with its own government, separate from the mainland. The country gained its independence from the United Kingdom in 1963 and became a constitutional monarchy. Now today there are many political parties in Zanzibar, but since the early 1990s, the politics have, have seen some pretty severe clashes between the two major parties. Contested elections 14 years ago led to a massacre when the army and police shot into crowds of protesters. 35 were killed and more than 600 wounded. At the time, those forces uh, that were also accompanied by members of the ruling party and militia went on to house-to-house -house rampages in the city. There were indiscriminate arrests, beatings, and sexual assaults of the residents. Some 2,000 people from Zanzibar fled north to nearby Kenya, only to return several years later. Now, violence erupted again in 2005, and nine people were killed. Four years later, not too long ago, the president of Zanzibar met with his security general from the opposition party and they discussed how to save the country from future political turmoil and strife and end the animosity between these parties. That move was welcomed by many, including the United States. It's it was a proposal to amend Zanzibar's constitution, and that was approved by about 66% of the people in 2010. That new constitution allows rival parties to form constitutional governments uh, with a national unity. So you now have these coalition governments, which is much better than what they had before. Enough on the government stuff. Now we can hardly end our visit here to, without talking about spices and fruit. Because I know you're hungry and you want to get up to the, to, 
tea time, you know. But, but anyway, spices are grown mostly in off-road areas that aren't really very accessible here. But they make their presence known when you go to the markets and stuff because you can smell them. You can almost taste them. They're so thick, thick in the air. Now, the use of spices is probably as old as human history itself. And as far back as 2600 B.C., there are records of the Egyptians feeding Asian spices to laborers who were building the Great Pyramid. Why'd they do that? To hopefully give them some additional strength. And well before the 6th century B.C., Confucius promoted the use of ginger in China. Europe was the first, the first imported spices long before Rome was even founded. And one legend has it that Vasco, Vasco da Gama's battle cry was, as he went out into the Indian Ocean, for Christ and spices. Spices were the first luxuries to appear in the European economy, and plants such as pepper, cinnamon, ginger, and nutmeg grew naturally only in the tropics. But those places were to the Europeans of the Middle Ages as remote as the reaches of outer space. The use of spices for seasoning and food was a status symbol. The exotic nature of spices was an emblem of wealth and prestige for anyone who could afford to use them. The symbolic use actually went well beyond meals because they could also present, be presented as gifts of state or bequeathed in wills. I mean, you want to give something to your kids? Don't give them a pile of money or a house. Give them a bag of cinnamon. Anyway, they could also be given along with other heirlooms. You could even pay rents and debts with spices rather than with gold. Now, since ancient times, there's been a flourishing maritime trade that existed between countries all surrounding the Indian Ocean. Goods from Indonesia, Malaysia, India have arrived in East Africa for centuries. And it's believed that spices from Asia arrived in Zanzibar long before the dawn of the European spice merchants, long, long before our friend da Gama got here. Now, the Portuguese traders established a base on Zanzibar as part of their plan to control East Africa. They imported various plants, including spices, from their colonies in South America and India. Land was cleared for plantations, but the Portuguese never really developed any kind of an agricultural presence on Zanzibar. They were more interested in it more as just a trading post to ship stuff in and out of. But, and it was left to the Omani Arabs to develop Zanzibar economically as a spice producer. Remember our first friend there, the Sultan... Uh, uh, bin Sa Saeed bin Sultan, uh, he began to govern Zanzibar and when he realized there was a potential that the island with its hot climate and regular rainfall was a great place for spices, he encouraged planting clove trees on the, on the local farms and so he required that for every coconut tree they had to plant two clove trees. Now because of that, Zanzibar became a major producer of spice, namely clove. With the end of the slave trade in the 19th century, spice became Zanzibar's primary economic source. European scientists built experimental stations here, and the government set up some farms to expand the growth of spices. And even today, there's areas on the country that have spice plantations that are controlled by the Tanzanian government. For the people of Zanzibar, spices and other useful plants are a vital part of everyday life. They grow them in local kitchen gardens, and they include things like pepper and cinnamon, ginger, cloves, cardamom, and nutmeg. And all of us have those in our gardens too, right? Don't you? Not me. My garden looks like the desert. Any <laughs> anyway, spices give flavor to the distinctive cu cuisine of Zanzibar, and they're all fresh. They all use them right out of the garden. They provide innumerable cures for everyday ailments and yield dyes and cosmetic products uh, that are needed to celebrate things like weddings and festivals. Now, nutmeg and cloves are Zanzibar's two main spices. Clove was once, at one time, the world's most valuable and expensive commodity. It was cloves that really sparked the Dutch's colonization in, in, uh, in India and over in uh, the Far East. That was the whole driving force, was that little plant. Now, cloves are actually a dried flower bud that is bright red when it's ready to be picked. And the cloves are used whole or ground to season things like ham, sausages, meats, mince meat pies, fish, and pickles. Clove in your pickles. They also are good if you have a toothache because they numb the tissues in the mouth. 
Now, cloves originated in Indonesia, but they were introduced in Zanzibar in the first half of the 19th century. And Zanzibar was once the world's leading clove producer, but as things go, 80% drop happened over the last 40 years. They're, they almost lost the whole thing. It was, crapple, it was crippled by very fast-moving global markets. There was international competition coming from other countries. And also, they had that uh, socialist uh, experiment that they tried back in the, in the 60s that wasn't really a big success. And that was when the government tried to control clove prices and exports, but what it did is it drove all of the business overseas. Zanzibar today is third, a distant third, from Indonesia, who supplies 75% of the world's clove. Now, nutmeg really resembles an apricot. It's about the same size as an apricot, and it comes from the fruit of an aromatic evergreen tree, has dark green leaves and a small yellow flower, and it ultimately has this little fruit. Now, the tree bears fruit when it's about seven years old, and it can do so for decades after that. The fruit has both nutmeg and mace inside of it. Now, inside is this walnut-sized seed that's covered with these reddish-orange strips. And the strips are called mace, and the inside seed is called nutmeg. They both have similar qualities. And mace is usually preferred for, you know, lighter dishes because it's bright orange saffron-like color. And also, nutmeg is slightly sweeter. Mace is a little more delicate in flavor than nutmeg. And nutmeg is great, usually grated or ground to flavor a lot of dishes. It's believed to cure digestion, liver problems, skin problems. Uh, mace, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Uh-oh, there it goes. I always carry a little piece of mace for my protection. Nutmeg is allegedly... Uh, alleged to be mildly hallucinogenic and to have aphrodisiac qualities as well. Now, it is said, I'm ringing. It is said that a woman's eyes actually get big when she's feeling romantic. I've never known. Uh, can you guys hear me? Is that better? Hello? Hello? There we are. Is that better? Okay. Anyway, it's said that a woman's eyes get bigger when she feels romantic, and it's used by females during the Muslim holidays as a disinhibitive, such as Western society may use, you know, alcohol. Would you like a glass of wine? Anyway, small amounts of it are grated into porridge that's used at weddings and other big gatherings where alcohol tends to be frowned upon, primarily in Arab countries. Now, achiote is sometimes called the lipstick tree, and its seeds are used to make body paint and lipstick. The heart-shaped fruits are brown, reddish-brown when they're ripe, and they have these little stiff, short hairs around them. Now, when fully mature, the, the fruit finally splits open, and it exposes these little dark red seeds. You know, we've seen other fruit like this, but this one's very different. The seed of the fruit is a little peppery and maybe with a hint of nutmeg. And its flavor is described as nutty and sweet. Now, after soaking the fruit, the pulp surrounding the seeds is made into cakes for further processing and to dye. It's also used as a food colorant, a commercial dye, and also for medicinal purposes. Now, the versatile seed can be used as sunscreen or as an insect repellent, uh, but that's not all. The seeds are dried and used whole or ground as a culinary spice. Achiote seeds are steeped in cooking oil, which infuses it with color and flavor. Cooking with that oil, or sautéing in it particularly, gives color to things like paella, meat, soups, and stews. The Aztecs used the seeds to intensify the color of their chocolate drinks. In fact, this plant grows all around the same tropical band around the world. The seeds can also be used to color things like rice, custard, baked goods, processed foods, snack food, breakfast cereals, and smoked fish. <coughs> Some historians theorize that in North America, the term redskins came from the use of, of achiote as body paint by the natives because it's a natural dye and turns the skin a, a reddish color. But a word of caution, this fruit has been linked to cases of food-related allergies. So if you may only want to try one seed at first and to see if you turn red. Now, the lipstick seed, <laughs> I love this picture. 
The lipstick seed is sold several ways, as seed, ground, or even as a paste, or infused into cooking oil or lard. Oh, I want mine in my lard. Anyway, you can buy these brightly colored red-orange seeds. But don't get, if you see them out in the market, don't get the ones that are dull or brown because those are well past their prime. Seeds are ground and whole, and they'll keep for up to three years. Just put them in an airtight glass container and stick them in a dark cabinet someplace. Now, I have to tell you, I plan on taking a couple of cases of this stuff home. Look at the money I can save when Susie doesn't have to buy lipstick anymore. <laughs> now, jackfruit is, a, is very plentiful in Zanzibar, but it's not your typical fruit. These things are huge. It's the largest tree fruit in the world, and they can be 100 pounds, the big ones. It grows on the branches, but mostly up on the trunks of trees, and some of those trees can be as much as 50 feet high. And having them grow on the trunk is probably a good thing because if you were out walking through your garden and you were under your jackfruit tree, you really wouldn't want to have one of these things drop on your head. Now, jackfruit has a very distinctive, they say musky smell. I guess it is. Uh, but it has a flavor that a lot of people describe as juicy fruit gum. Everybody, Anybody remember juicy fruit? Back when I didn't have dentures, I used to chew it all the time. Anyway, they're also a nutritional bonanza because they have, among other things, protein, potassium, and vitamin B in the fruit itself. And they're only about 95 calories for a half a cup. So they aren't quite as high in carbohydrate or caloric uh, content as other staples that you might have, such as rice. Anyway, that's it for now. I'd like to thank you for coming today. And we can discuss today's talk out in the baristas, and all you Binghamtonians can meet me out there, too. And I'm going to pack up so we can get out there. I'd like you to join me for other presentations, and those will be in the currents uh, every night. So uh, the next one will be, I think, at our next sea day. And this lecture will repeat on your stateroom television, uh, channel 27. Now, be the first to find me after 6.30 tonight. Oh, my wife says no, make it 5.30. After 5.30 tonight and win three big O points. Here's the question. By what name was John Rowlands better known? Thank you. Have a great evening. <laughs>